most of the other uh, conferences around the country. So I don't know. I think a lot of factors played into it. I mean, it was really hot and humid. Yeah, it was very um, hot and very sunny. Yes, yes. So I don't think it was just the social justice warriors. I'm sure they lost a few people f- from that, but not me. I don't think anybody should not go somewhere just because somebody says, hey, we don't like this, don't go. I would have gone no matter what. Yeah, I, I, I think that... <laughs> If at anything that had maybe 40 or 50 people didn't show up because of that. Um, there was also uh, trains being worked on the metro. So if people were local and knew that, they might just say, eh, it's hot out. I'm going to take a pass. I don't want to deal with the trains. Boy, I bet that Uber and Lyft were so happy that week. I mean, I lifted and Ubered everywhere. And there were just just going on. I mean, I could I could access an Uber or a Lyft and there'd be one right there yeah. every time. So, they were out in force. Yeah, I I know I tried Uber for the first time myself. So, you tried Uber for the first time? Yeah, and I I had uh I very rarely use cabs anyway and and so, you know, I might use one and hadn't thought about it, but I ended up at the uh, Crystal City Hyatt, which is a good 10 or 12 miles away and apparently cabs cost 30 plus dollars for that trip. Wow. But Uber was 10 bucks. Yeah. And it was also magical because a couple of times I, I hit where I could share a ride with somebody. Yes. And I had one trip back where the Uber driver picked me up, did not even drive a full fucking block, picked up a second person, drove 12 miles, dropped me off, and the second person was going to a location four blocks from me. That's so great. I love it. And I was uh, talking to one of the uh, the bellmen at the hotel, and I said, uh, how does this Uber thing affect in cabs? And he goes, cabs are doomed. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the all. cab drivers need to start Ubering. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so tell me, what what's uh, hot topics on your show? What have you guys covered lately that uh, the listeners should go and listen to? Well, we uh, have, you know, we have topics all over the place. Uh, we mostly focus on religion and uh, skepticism, but things happen in our day-to-day lives that we like to talk about. And one of the things that happened recently was our local skeptic group that I'm involved with put on a skeptic camp. And it was, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine a better arranged, formed, well-done skeptic camp. It was done at Santa Monica College. It was done on a college campus. We had a lecture room. We had about 10 or 12 people who were going to speak. And and do you think your listeners would know what a skeptic camp is? Well, I most of them would, but why don't you explain it anyway, just to be sure? Well, I feel like to sum it up, it would be a skeptic camp is like a conference, an open mic for conferences. So people who have never spoken before, your peers would put together a talk anywhere from 10 minutes to a half an hour to 45 minutes or longer, depending, uh, on a topic that they're passionate about that has to do with skepticism, and they would put it on. But these are people who are amateurs, our friends, and other, uh, other people who might be interested in giving talks in the future come together. It's very small. We had maybe 40, maybe 50 people in our in our skeptic camp and it's not advertised really. It's not a huge conference where people show up and just about everyone who comes to the skeptic camp is giving a talk. Almost everyone usually. Um, So it's kind of neat because it's a place to get your chops uh, going and, uh, you know, give a talk for the first time. And then afterwards there's a Q and a, and sometimes during people ask questions, there's a Q and a, and then you get a chance to answer uh, questions. So it's a really neat little thing for people who are or skeptics uh, to get a feel of what it's like to give a talk at a conference. I know I've been to, to several uh, in Chicago. They you know they put one together real quick, and next thing you know, you've got a hundred people that show up in a room that holds eighty. Um, so you have people just standing around, and each talk was twenty minutes, and then five or six minutes of questions, and then a couple minutes to change over for the next presentation. And uh, kind of like the shampoo commercial, lather, rinse, repeat. We just kept yeah. doing that over and over and over. Uh, took a break where uh, people either went uh, across the street to get food or you ordered some pizzas in. And an hour later, you do another four hours and bam, you're done. That's what it was like. And 
all the topics were really interesting. So it was fun to see your friends on, you know, at a, at a podium. And some people had PowerPoint and some people didn't. Some people had handouts. There we had snacks, and then we all went out to lunch. It was really great, and a, and a, and I really enjoyed it. But something really awful happened at our skeptic camp. Oh, what was that? <laughs> well, we had one speaker who did a really controversial talk. It was about O.J. Simpson, uh, and so. One of the things is he had a, uh, I, um, I forget what you call it, a handout that kind of was a layout of what he was going to talk about. And when he did his talk, he was given 45 minutes and he didn't talk about anything in the order that he was going to talk about on the handout. It was kind of like, I, I forget what you call it, you know, an index or something. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, the people in the audience were getting upset because – the talk started to creep into uh, less skepticism and more uh, controversial. Um, uh, what's the word when someone's a, tr- a 9-11 truther? What's that word? Uh, um, um, I'm trying Conspiracy to think. I'm trying theory. to think. Uh, well, he was saying conspiracy theory. He was yeah. talking more conspiracy theory than he was skepticism. So people were kind of upset but everyone waited till after his 45 minute talk was done and then they started grilling him and it started to get really intense for a minute there and people were asking questions and he was kind of getting you could see a little upset and then just as the questioning was going to kind of make a turn to come back to him and say well ask everyone in the audience what could what would have been a better way to give the presentation so it was more skepticism and not the other way and he just as this moment happened he had a massive what we think is some sort of heart attack coronary failure something and he fell down and dropped dead whoa yeah yeah well that that was not where i was expecting that to end (laughs) of course not no one does no one expects that but we couldn't have done a better job at getting you know the paramedics there performing CPR, everyone ran to do a task, you know, notifying the police. Um, We had uh, just great people in there trying to get him to, uh, you know, lay down straight. He was, he fell over on his face and he hit his chin on the table. So we had one person doing CPR until the paramedics could get there. Um, You know, we had people clearing the room and I mean, the whole, it, ordeal lasted about, I would say, between us and the paramedics working on him, about a half an hour. Uh, And that may seem like a long time, but the paramedics worked on him straight for 20 minutes before they took him away. Just as he was explaining the truth to you, someone took him out. Well, (laughs) yes. (laughs) Well, just as soon as the the argument was about to turn around and calm everything down, that's when he he fell. And and everyone was just in shock wow. in shock but uh i mean we did everything we possibly could have done to help and i think wow it was an experience i i guess so well uh, you know, i don't know what to follow up with that so i tell you what i'd like to do let's just take a little commercial break okay and then we'll come back and we'll talk more about your shows and maybe where people can find you so think about that as, okay <laughs> as we take our commercial break Here's an excerpt from The God Virus by Daryl W. Ray. Every day, religion affects us in ways we may not realize. It makes your Uncle Ned spend hours praying for you. It gives your Baptist neighbor a reason to reject her own child who married a Catholic. It teaches your Pentecostal sister to spank her children to keep them from going to hell. It requires a Catholic priest to deny his sex drive. It causes people to give enormous amounts of money to religious organizations and causes you to avoid talking to your cousin Jenny for fear she may try to convert you to Jehovah's Witnesses. Religion has both obvious and subtle influences on you and on society. This book explores the impact of religion on you and your world. It draws open the curtain of mystery and offers ways to understand and make informed decisions about religion. Have you ever wondered what makes religion so powerful? What makes people profess deep faith even as they act in ways that betray that faith? What makes people blind to the irrationalities of their own religion 
yet see clearly the problems of other religions? How does it weave its way into our political system? If these and similar questions interest you, this book will help you understand its power in you, your family, and your culture. The God Virus by Daryl W. Ray is available at atheistaudiobooks.com. All right, everybody, welcome back. This is Phil Ferguson, and you are still listening to The Phil Ferguson Show. And now Heather is going to give us something uplifting, I hope. Um, and where, well, where can we find you next? <laughs> um, you can always find me on the Ardent Atheist and Skeptically Yours podcast. I wanted to mention that me, uh, Emery, and I, and along with Bruce, um, oh my goodness, I'm so horrible with names, Margaret Downey and Bruce Gleason, we're uh, forming a brand new conference that's going to be in January, and it's going to be called Logical. And where is Log that going to be? Logical LA. So it'll be in LA. Aha. Uh -huh. And it starts on th Friday the 13th, and it kicks off with a big Friday the 13th party that uh, Margaret Downey is famous for throwing every year. She is her Triskaidekaphobia. Triskaidekaphobia, yeah. something like that party. Yeah. So we're kicking that off. We've got. Great people on the lineup, which I will not uh, tell you who that is just yet. But uh, we're going to have a lot of great speakers, local and from far away. And so we're working on that right now. And we're going to have early bird specials. So keep an eye out for the Logical Conference, uh, Logical LA Conference coming Where up. Where specifically yeah. in LA will that take place? It will be very close to the LAX uh, airport. Okay. Uh, it's at a brand new hotel owned by Hyatt. And it's totally remodeled, brand new, brand spanking new. It's gorgeous inside. And so it's going to be a really special. Well, that is fantastic. I, I was just out there, you may know. Oh, yeah. I was even in Santa Monica. You were? Yeah. You were following me around. Yeah, I, 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 I got the opportunity to pay $64 for one day's parking. Oh, ew. It's called a ticket. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's horrible. Yeah, it was a nice, empty little neighborhood street, and apparently there's some sign somewhere that says uh, permit only. Ugh, Oops. Yeah. Oopsie. I did want to mention that uh, we, on the podcast, we have one episode right before the Skeptical, uh, little Skeptical, Skeptical, I'm sorry, uh, Skeptic Camp we had. Yeah. And then we did a follow-up podcast after the Skeptic Camp. So you could go back and listen to Skeptically Yours and hear about the event in full. Very cool. Now, this uh, conference in L.A., you said it was January 13th it starts? Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th. And, uh, and I'm sure L.A. generally doesn't have a couple of feet of snow. That's correct. Uh, on January 13th. But uh, people traveling from the Midwest and New England could have a real rough time. Yes, and also you can give the gift of skepticism to your family this holiday by buying them a ticket to to Logical, <laughs> to Logical LA. Logical in January. So, so when it's called Logical LA, does that mean there's going to be a Logical SF or SD? We hope so. Ooh, it's going to franchise. Yeah, this is our first one, and we're hoping to do it every year and branch out. That is fantastic. Uh, now, skeptically yours, how is that different than the Ardent Atheist Show? On Skeptically Yours, we don't really talk about religion, although sometimes we get into it, but we talk about things that people believe in, like astrology or chemtrails, things about the government, <laughs> uh, you know, things that people have beliefs in, ghosts, and, and we get people, we have comedians come on on both shows, and we get them to reveal to us their little funny beliefs, and we talk about it with them. It's funny, you reminded me with the chemtrails uh, at some point many years ago when my wife was starting to have doubts about her religion, uh, she called me up at, at work and, and she said, uh, you know how I see signs? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I know how you claim to see signs. Go, go on. And she says, I saw a couple of planes pass each other. And when, what's that thing that they leave behind, that white thing? And I said, uh contrails and she goes yeah yeah they passed each other and you know what they made and i'm thinking they made a cross right, right. but but that's not what i want to say out loud and plus i want to be funny almost all the time so i said a hammer and sickle <laughs> 
And she says, no, there were three of them. They made an A. And I'm like, what? And she goes, I'm an atheist. Aww. And I was like, but, but you can't be an atheist.